Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our session. This is uh, Innovating on the Edge, AI in the Classroom. Uh, it's a deep pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, we have quite a panel, very, very, very impressive panel. Um, and you're going to take away quite a bit. My job is to make sure that these people talk more and that these people look good. I hope you guys like get into some like engaging debate as well. So um, I'll do my best to... And I don't know if there will be questions later, but if there are, we'll try to field some of that too, okay? All right, my name is David Yi. I'm um, an investor entrepreneur in AI. I come from the Ethos Fund. That's enough about me. Um, you can Google me at some point and you'll find more. But let's focus on these people, all right? So let's go down the row. Could you please introduce yourselves and tell us all a little bit about your involvement in AI for the classroom? All right. Uh, keep Hi, it under everyone. two minutes, please. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Noreen Hall, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at InSpace. Um, before I started InSpace, I was a professor in machine learning at Champlain College. So throughout my career, I have been working with um, machine learning and AI. And so right now at InSpace, we're actually using, um, it's a video collaboration platform, and we use uh, AI for um, doing toxicity filters. So if there is bullying in the classroom or someone types a message that has context, um, it actually calls it out and doesn't let students type that. Pretty awesome. Next, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Kian katan -Forush. I'm a founder, co-founder and CEO at Workera and a lecturer in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford University, where my focus is on neural networks and deep learning. Uh, previously, uh, I was a founding member at a company called deeplearning.ai, where I was focused on democratizing access to AI education, working with Andrew Eng. Um, between the two of us, we we were fortunate to teach AI to over 3 million people around the world. And uh, number one feedback that we would get from organizations and learners and governments who were engaging in those classes was that in, in, in today's world, there's a notion of available content. And the limiting factor to developing skills is not content anymore. Uh, people are struggling to understand the skills they have, the skills they don't have, the skills they need, and how they compare to others. And so this led to the creation of WorkCare.ai that focuses on helping enterprises, governments, and learners understand their technology capabilities, skills at a granular level, and uh, generate personalized learning plans that features third-party content in a meaningful way, uh, basically revoking the one-size-fits-all approach to education. Yeah, nice to meet you. Hi, uh, I'm Zhou Yu. I'm an assistant professor at Columbia University. I teach natural language processing, machine learning. So my expertise is mostly on using machine learning models to make NLP technologies better. I also have a startup on the side, which is coming from my research on chatbots. We use chatbots to uh, help people learn languages. So you can imagine that chatbots is your conversational partner. We can train, you can train with the chatbot at any time. We also have the still curriculum within the chatbots. So they will cover specific syntax, uh, grammars, uh, lexicons. Um, we also give you um, automatic feedbacks on your grammars, uh, word uses, uh, content. So you can think about it's a supplement for um, uh, in-person classes for languages. Okay, thank you. Hey everyone, great to be here. My name is Aaron Sisto. Um, awesome to see so many uh, people in person and actually meeting my colleague Joe for the first time uh, after working together for three years or so. Um, so my background is between startups and venture capital. Um, I spent about three or four years at a venture firm called InQtel based in DC, uh, which is the strategic investor for US defense and intelligence, looking mostly at things like enterprise AI uh, and you know other things a little further out. Um, left with a few colleagues uh, to co-found a venture-backed startup called Searchable, uh, which is in the conversational AI space. And over the last year, I've gotten back to investing at Schmidt Futures, which is Eric Schmidt's family office, and actually just joined a new deep tech fund called First Spark Ventures, where I'm looking at AI, metaverse, and everything in between. So excited for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. It's an exciting panel. All right. I'm just going to go right into the question, just for the jugular, OK? So I, I'd like to know, and um, 
any one of you can answer this. And if you don't answer it in five seconds, I'm just going to volunteer somebody, okay? Um, so what are your top concerns or concern when it comes to AI in the classroom? What keeps you up at night? Please, yes. That was five seconds. Well, someone has to answer, right? So, you know, it's, it's really interesting. The way I see this is um, there are definitely some concerns around, like, sort of bias and privacy and sort of how we handle data and all of that, and we should be very careful in addressing all of that and having many, many discussions and conversations around this. Um, it's also, like, really education around what is AI, like, what is machine learning, and making sure that everybody understands it. Because the way I see it, it really can amplify how teachers teach their classes, right? So there's a lot of things that are very logistical, right? So like all of that, if you can do with AI, then you can spend a lot of the time really connecting with students in a classroom and spending that real valuable time there. And th th this is kind of one of the things that we have discovered. So when pandemic started and, you know, I was teaching um, in in a classroom, and I started teaching virtually, and I, I discovered that through technology, some of that authentic learning moments were just not happening, right? And especially when it comes to hands-on experiences and collaboration, and really just having that human interactions where like people can create knowledge together. And so from that perspective, what we have done is like really just started building this platform where we use machine learning to kind of really create this intuitive experiences without sort of overstepping to a point where it's like too impersonal, right? So like really just like understanding what it is so people are not afraid to try it because it can really also amplify a lot of the processes that we do. I mean, this is such a good general question that I'd like to... Yes. Um, I can say a little bit about it. So I think uh, AI technology really requires a lot of data to make it smarter and better. So at first, you will have to have buy-ins from the teachers, the schools, to believe this is going to get better. So this is sort of always this kind of trust is hard to um, facilitate at first. I think it's really uh, opening for like a conversations about where this is going and how long we're going to see this kind of effect of getting it better over time. Speaking of teachers, oh, wait, well, go ahead, please, Aaron, please. No, no, I think I think that that conversation around how do we safely develop these tools in the classroom? I mean, it's, there's no other way to do it. It has to be developed in the, the application setting. Um, I think the other kind of uh, thing that I think about a lot here is um, emotional intelligence, and especially in a classroom when you're you're um, you know teaching kids sometimes very hard topics. AI just isn't at a at a place where it, you know it can. It has a lot of emotional intelligence and can respond to children and even people, uh, depending on their uh, emotional state. And so I think, I think as we kind of like discuss how far AI can go in the classroom and you know who who is going to be displaced eventually, like this this could become one of the major barriers uh, to seeing widespread adoption. I mean, while we're at it, Kian, why don't, what what's a concern that you have for AI in the classroom? Um, I think AI has been used a lot for recommendations, but a lot of these recommendations are noisy and uh, don't lead to actual outcomes or satisfaction from the learner because not of the models, but because of the underlying data. A lot of data is being collected, but we don't know exactly what that data means. And so there is a need for more validity and reliability in that, in that data layer, even before building the models on top of it. These are all such good concerns. Um, how about this one? It kind of goes back to what Joey was getting at, and Aaron, you touched on it too, is people talk about AI replacing teachers in the classroom. Uh, can we hear a little more about that? Aaron, would you like to start that one? Sure. I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a worthwhile discussion, right? You know, looking at these kind of existential threats early is... Um, is a great way to sort of map out where we want AI to go because clearly it's not there yet. AI is not going to replace teachers anytime soon. And I, I think, you know, maybe the, the more uh, near-term conversation is where should AI slot in? You know, are there places where AI can be a safe and meaningful part of a curriculum that perhaps makes a teacher's job easier? Um, like you were saying, and um, allows them to focus more on you know, individual time with a student. 
Yeah, I can jump in. It's, um, you, you know, it's kind of interesting. So when I was teaching, like, you know, any job I pretty much had, like, obviously as a data scientist, like, I'm very passionate about automating things, right? So anytime I'm doing something twice, like, there's, like, this literal thing, like, can I automate that process? And so, you know, when I was teaching, I actually automated quite a bit of my grading. So in computer science, it's, it's a little bit easier, right? So, like, students are submitting coding, and then you can just, like, literally, like, have a code to download everything, goes through it, come up with like comments and everything, and then upload back. And then, however, there's certain points where you actually need to have a check. So like taking a lot of that sort of things that could be automated out of the way actually lets you to focus on things that are really important and spend time on those things. So from that perspective, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, however, it's, it's very, very hard to imagine like completely replicating that process and replacing the teachers for me anyway, because I think for me it's like teaching really happens when like everyone is together working towards something and creating knowledge together. It's not lecturing, right? It's not like any of that. So, and to do that effectively, like you really have to have that human connection because like when students feel connected, they can learn. And this is exactly why we sort of did all these things at InSpace. So like people more feel more connected so they can learn better. But then that doesn't mean we can like take 80% of the things or 20% of things out of the way so we can focus on things that really are important. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I, I don't agree with AI will replace teachers, but I think that's, uh, AI augmented facilitators will replace most of the teachers. Um, facilitators, because I believe in the, the future of flipped classroom format. I think that uh, in a, when I was in high school, maybe out of 10 professors that I had, 10 instructors, maybe two of them were good, not, not the rest. And, you know, they, they're, arguably there is education behind it to fix it. But today, I, I would have rather have the best math teacher, wherever they are in the world, give me the theory and have a bunch of facilitators, maybe who are a year ahead of me in high school, to help facilitate and bring that human connection. So I'm very bullish on the facilitator format. I think it has a macro implication on how we train the workforce, because we don't need as many teachers, if, even if it's hard to hear. Um, and AI augmented, I don't think AI will solve everything, but I think uh, I'm especially bullish on um, AI for measurements and AI for personalization. Measurements because it is hard for humans to compete with an AI who has collected so much data on measuring people around the world, across geographies, across seniority levels, um, you know, compared to a human today. If I ask someone uh, what is 3 times 7 equals 21, I kind of know that I don't need to ask them two plus two equal four because there is a correlation between these two skills and I can infer it. Now imagine an AI can do that across thousands of skills and after 20 questions, it can generate a full map of someone's skills across thousands of skills. It's hard for a human to compete with that. So I'm especially bullish on that and the implication on recommendations using that data. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add something really quick there. Those are great points. Um, I, you know, I think the really interesting piece here is if we, if we start to think about roadmaps for AI to get to the place where it can automate large portions of the, the teaching workflow, um, there needs to be an ongoing exchange with experts in learning science, which, you know, is not, I, I, don't, I don't think is really um, apparent right now. Um, but the, the reason for that is, you know, we, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I need, I need an expert in learning science. <laughs> um, uh, right, so um, assessment is very challenging, and there are a lot of skills that we just don't know how to measure yet, even for people. And so you run into this classic problem in machine learning where if the operator can't de deliver the right training data or train the machine to do a certain task, like measure someone's memory capacity, for example, uh, it, it's highly unlikely that the model is just going to discover how to measure this on its own. Now, it's not impossible. It's an interesting area of research, but uh, it's a huge problem when you, when you start to think about it. Yeah, I just want to add a little bit more on the technology side. So, for example, I work on natural language processing. So there is like an automatic grammar corrections. Um, there is also chatbots serve as TAs to answer questions 
uh, that we can find ground truths on textbooks. So these are really uh, small steps we can go forward uh, to help individual students. Because we know uh, during the class, you just uh, get teachers a fraction of attention. Well, individual students really need more time and support. These AI-based systems can give you the support. I think that's sort of a, a step forward to facilitate, facilitate better learning. Um, I think like, uh, of course, everybody wanted to like have a personalized like uh, instructor, so you have like a uh, personalized curriculums. But uh, in current like uh, education system, this is uh, impossible. But at least with the automated machines, so you can have like semi-automated like uh, um, course selections or these kind of supports, so that you get more attention from the AI, and it can then we always wanted more teachers, like better teachers. So that sort of part wouldn't change, but you have better supports from the AI. Yeah, and. I also wanted to sort of build a little bit on what Kian mentioned too. So the measurements, right? So I feel like the past two years from data collection perspective have been really interesting opportunity. So like, because all the classes were happening virtually during pandemic, we got this unprecedented opportunity to actually see what happens in a real classroom environment and how learning actually happens. So I think at InSpace, we were a little bit fortunate to like really be able to understand that. And so what we have started doing is now we have all this data to measure the quality of the conversation. Like, how is everybody doing? Like, how engaged are students? Are they really uh, learning and participating, or are they really disengaged? And so one of the things that we did discover was this I idea of pauses. And like, if you're looking at a conversation and you kind of start noticing patterns, like how pauses are happening, and the best conversations actually happen when people start interrupting each other. That's like really active, engaging conversation. And so there was like this clear pattern. And so this is just the beginning of understanding how learning happens and what's effective and whatnot. And now we get to measure this because of all the virtual learning that, that's happening. Now, the other point that you mentioned was personalized learning. I, I think that's really something we should go further on because like in my classroom, like. Um, when I have projects, like when students pick their own idea, projects, like I had a student doing like a machine learning project on beanies, like you know those hats? He had like 200 different kinds of beanies and he was so excited about this project. I was like, <laughs> all right. And so if we can take the content and use machine learning to make it personalized for every single topic that students are passionate about, they'll be so much more engaged in that process. Okay, I have a question. I think it's a good question based on everything you guys just said. Um, you're talking a lot about data, right? So this is a two-part question. Part one is, uh, I think they're related, that's why it's a two-part question. So uh, how do you deal with uh, data-centric AI? Is there enough, I mean, is data, um, basically big data AI possible in education? That's the first question, is it? And secondly, how do we deal with bias in the data, right? So first part of the question is, is big data AI possible in education? And second part is then what about the biases in the data? You want to start? Okay. Um, you can go. Uh, so first question on is it possible? I, I, I do think there is an issue. The, the, um, and I would say um, the issue is not AI in the classroom or of the classroom. It's data in the classroom and of the classroom. Um, if you go on, uh, and I, I love LinkedIn, uh, I use it, but uh, if you go on LinkedIn and you look at your job recommendations, most of the time you're not going to like it or ref you know, apply to it. And, and the reason is not that LinkedIn does not have machine learning engineers. They have hundreds of machine learning engineers that are extremely qualified. Um, it's really, uh, and they also use state-of-the-art models. It's really the underlying data that does not allow us to make a strong inference that is compelling for the user. And this applies to a lot of different problems in education. Um, so I, I think uh, first let's fix the data layer. And then when we have rich data around skills, simple models will beat, you know, simple models on clean and valid and reliable data will build hardcore transformers on uh, very noisy data. I think that's gonna happen. Uh, the second part of your question was on bias. Um, I, I, I tend to think more of uh, how can AI be deployed responsibly and reliably rather than just looking at bias because bias can happen in the data, it can happen in the model, it can happen in the inference. And responsible AI encompasses explainability, fairness, uh, privacy, security, reliability, m many other topics. 
um, in assessment specifically, because that's what I'm, I'm mostly focused on, if you ask a math question in the context of someone playing baseball, you are biased because uh, you require a different knowledge than what you're supposed to measure. And two thirds of the world actually don't know what baseball is. I've been in the US for seven years. I don't know the rules of baseball. <laughs> um, um, and so in order to fix that, that or this bias, you need to bring together psychometricians. You need to bring together ML scientists. You need to bring also subject matter experts from a diversity of backgrounds, seniorities, geographies, and you need to look for these. You can automate part of it by having models that try to explain and mitigate bias, whether it's in the data, in the model, or in the inference, but it has to be proactively done by the teams. Yeah, I just want to add that um, education data especially involves students or like even minors, minors under age students. It's uh, very sensitive. It's very hard to find large-scale learning data online that you can compete on scores, like a classification, accuracy, or something. So this is like by definition really hard to get a lot of data in a very specific problem. And uh, even for companies um, uh, like ETS or Pearson, they have a lot of data, but they, they're not allowed to release their data. So a lot of their work, um, they do publish um, academic papers, but it's hard to replicate it because the data is not public. Um, so we always have this kind of uh, concern, especially for people like me who are in a university, we only want to work on public data so other people can replicate it and trust our results. So it really creates this barrier that not a lot of learning people, experts, are willing to go down to the education path. Uh, only people are really dedicated to think, oh, it's a social good, it's a really interesting problem, we'll go down. So th there is really calling out for uh, how to collect a pul public accessible data, um, how to formulate the problem that a lot of people can work on it uh, without understanding too much domain uh, expert uh, expertise. So um, another problem, as, uh, as we said before, about biases, uh, about accountabilities, uh, measurements, for example. Um, I worked on automatic assessment of language proficiencies. So if you think about it, where do you take your test? Actually, it has a high correlation with your results. So you probably know why it, why it is that, right? Because if you take the test in, uh, for example, um, Sweden, or like Norway, you probably get a pretty high score because most of the people there speak English pretty okay. But if you took the test in China or other places that you have like a variety of uh, degrees of proficiency, then you have these kind of high correlations you see. So if you are um, a person who is not familiar with these kind of biases, you can just build a model and train um, just on this feature and get pretty good results and you don't know why. And you can deploy this algorithm somewhere and really hurt people. So there's a lot of sort of good practice in our community about how to reduce biases. Um, at the same time, like we're also having various uh, sort of uh, effort in, for example, explain your model, explainable model. When you generate a, a result, it's a yes or no, or maybe it's a percentage. How can you explain to people who are gonna use it, what does it really mean? Um, so there's a lot of efforts in this, but um, it's hard to say I, um, how well and how much uh, the, the actual companies are taking this into consideration and deploying their algorithms. Um, but this is at least sort of a call from, from the academic side and also from the society side to make sure that this is integrated in any products they deploy. I'll, I'll continue with the, you know, there's a, a term in the, uh, you know, AI community that's getting more and more popular, which is robustness. And I think this goes along with a lot of the points you just made. But the idea is to use a baseball analogy. If you throw a, if you throw a curveball, you know, in an AI model, will it still do the thing that it's intended to do? And so in an education setting, you can imagine, you know, if a child um, starts crying or walks away from the Zoom screen, you know, most of these models will actually fall apart because, like you said, Joe, they've been developed in a vacuum. And real world constraints and conditions were not programmed in from the onset. So I would say that's right up there with bias in terms of, uh, you know, um, things to consider. 
Yeah, and I wanted to add, so obviously we all know this, like in education, data privacy is really, really, really important. To my opinion, data privacy is really important no matter where you are. And even though we know we get tracked everywhere on social media and our data is all out there, I don't think it's a secret anymore. <laughs> so, but I think for education, I think for me, it's, it's, a, it's a big priority. And um, it can be very expensive as an ad tech company to be able to really make sure that all of the data is anonymized and everything is like done right. So you never have compromised situation. But I think that that's going to be really important from the big data perspective. I think there should be regulations more heavily. So like we, we all kind of, especially like as there's more tech companies, we're all following the same thing so we don't end up in the same place we do with like, you know, social media <laughs> and other stuff. And I, I'm a user of social media and I totally, um, yeah. And then the other part of it, as far as the bias goes, you know, um, as humans, we're, we're inherently biased, right? So this is just like how we are and not because we're malicious about it. It's just like how, how we think about this. So like if you think about like, you know, in eighth grade when I was like coding, I naturally just put my bias into the code. So like every time you use a piece of software, it's someone who built it and they had made some assumptions that came from the backgrounds that they came from or the things that they interact with in their environment. And so like when it comes to machine learning models, it's amplified, right? Because now you have all this data. First of all, historical data can be very, very biased, right? So like we have like many cases where for example, like historically, maybe um, women weren't in colleges as much, so now you use that historical data, and now you get a biased assumption that a new applicant maybe is not as good, right? So like, there's all these different cases. Now, if you haven't seen, there's this uh, short movie called Human Bias. They go through all of this. I won't go through that, but it's it's really interesting cases. So like, if you're um, in this this other example of facial recognition, so you have if you have a lab uh, with less diversity and you're developing it, of course you're testing it as you're developing um, as you go. So th there's like all these interesting cases that rise from that. So it's important to kind of keep a check, but then some of the things won't surface until, unfortunately, they're like out there, right? I mean, then just kind of following up on that then, um, it sounds to me that big data is important. There's not enough out there, right? Bias is natural. We're gonna have to work around it, if I'm summing it up correctly. So why isn't, if, what I'm hearing is that data is there, it's not a priority, shared, right? Um, we don't have a community, a vet tech community, like organizing it in a useful fashion. What the heck are we doing? Do we care about education? What, what's going on? Why, why, why haven't we resolved this issue? There's a lot of smart people in the world. What, what do you think is going on here? Why isn't it a priority is my question. I mean, just to kick it off, you know, I think a, a follow-up question there is, you know, who, who, who should it be a priority for and who should be building these tools to create an ecosystem where you can freely share secure and anonymized data? You have marketplaces and platforms to host your machine learning models for researchers. I mean, I think we're, we're just in the early stages here of scoping out what would, what would be a very impactful project for a whole bunch of stakeholders to undertake. Um, I actually don't think data is there. I think data is not there. <laughs> that, uh, the, the reason is, um, and I have a view more on workforce transformation than K-12. I think it's slightly different. But if you ask um, uh, an enterprise leader, uh, what, what data do you have about your people? On, on, you know, like what are they completing? They, would, they may tell you, well, uh, Alice and Bob completed a course in machine learning. They have that certificate. Um, well, that poses a problem because one, Having a certificate in machine learning doesn't say anything about your skills in machine learning or says somewhat of a thing. Maybe Alice did it very diligently and you know, Bob just nailed down all the quizzes by repeating the question as many times as they needed to complete the course. Uh, and second, machine learning is not a skill. If you look at machine learning on the job of a machine learning engineer, there's probably four or 500 skills. So how can you make a recommendation if you have data here while you need to have 400 data points there at different levels of cognition, what knowledge is needed, what application skill are needed, what synthesis skill or analysis skills are needed. And as long as we don't have that layer of data being able to break down something like machine learning in 400 skills, we cannot really make good recommendations.
I think that's a really good point. And depending on the application, right, depending what you're saying, uh, doing, like, uh, I, I mean, there's also many, many opportunities where, like, we can absolutely use data to help, like, students that I, I think we're still, like, connecting the dots. So, for example, one thing we noticed is, like, sort of taking, like, the, the student's experience and looking at it from 360 degrees, right? So, like, it, it just... I guess we were maybe lucky to be in that space at the right time, but like, so looking at the student engagement in the classroom and then comparing to student engagement outside of the classroom, and now you have very clear models that can tell you like, okay, the students, like there's a prediction, like, okay, you should reach out to the students, right? At what points you can help with like, it, those are like really critical moments. So I, I would love to see more of that, right? Where we do have those data and so it doesn't go wasted, um, but then, completely agree there's no way you can make that recommendation in some of those other cases unless we just keep collecting more and more data. Just curiosity. If collecting more and more data, and we had talked about this, you know, there's kind of a, kind of a backlash with what, how data has been collected in the past, right? We want to do this in a better way, more, I, I would say, more ethical way, if, if you will. Um, since all of you play with this industry, has, um, do you have any recommendations to all of us who are concerned about this? Is, is there something we can do as a community, right, to do this better? I think, uh, so I'm gonna sound like a professor here from, <laughs> but like, I think like if you're using any software, right, ed tech software or any software, like just make, like if you can do the due diligence and like really ask the company to share all their data privacy policies. I, I mean, it's always there, but like, do check because there's like quite a bit of difference. And like, I, I think if we can all work towards something together where it's a little bit more regulated so like we can actually have more response, like, because right now there's really no reward for like being the responsible player or not. So the more we go towards it as a community, I think the more there'll be incentives to actually go that extra mile and make sure that things are, you only need the data that, you only have the data that you really, really need. Yeah, I mean, you know, thinking through this problem, you can, you can see a lot of parallels in other industries too, healthcare, defense, banking. Um, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these industries didn't buy in immediately the same way tech did, and we're seeing the effects right now. They're slowly starting to get up to speed. I think in a lot of ways, education is the same, uh, and it generally takes some very early believers and some really, um, really concrete demonstrations of efficacy to get people excited. Um, but then it also just takes um, a large community to buy in and embrace the kind of strangeness of AI where you are sharing data, you're generating data constantly, you're updating models. It doesn't work perfectly the first time. These are, these are more cultural issues that you come up against um, that it just takes a lot of time and education to, uh, to teach uh, new folks about this stuff. So I just wanna add like your, um, for example, if you're using certain softwares, and then you, you wanted to, so for the developers, it's important to communicate with certain researchers or people who wanted to use the data for a better, uh, for better functionalities to communicate what data should be logged, right? So once you start that, uh, once you started out in the classroom, there's no way of going back. Every data point is really important. So it's really, I, I think it's a sort of a responsible way to really think ahead of time what informations you may need in the future uh, before you actually start all the like data uh, collections or pilots. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, I, I would just add, it's hard to give a, an answer because the, the audience is probably experts from all over the, the world and, and different functions. Uh, but um, I think one advice for learners and then for organizational leaders, for learners, and hopefully a lot of experts here are lifelong learners, so we're all learning, is to take the time to assess yourself regularly. I think, uh, as, as Nareen was saying, we're in an attention economy where a lot of content is being pushed to us for whatever reason. We need to shift to a learning economy where whenever we're consuming content, we know why we're consuming that content, and it maps to a longer-term 
outcome that we're trying to drive for our career. And, in, and, and measurement or assessment is the best investment you can make. Take a two-hour assessment and decide how you're going to spend the next 200 hours of your life learning. And you do that every 200 hours. I think there's a shift or a mentality shift for learners. And then for organizational leaders, I think that uh, uh, oftentimes we, we, we think about learning and HR and talent as three different things, but it all connects. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see the rise of a chief talent officer that encompasses the learning part, the HR part, and the ops part behind the scenes, um, and that is going to be responsible for measuring all of what is happening. And when you can measure, you can recommend learning, you can make the good hires, you can match people to projects, all of that connecting with the skill signal within your organization, whether it's an enterprise, a government, or a, a university. That, that's a really uh, great point. And I think also to build up on Aaron's point here is like, you know, like understanding how machine learning works and understanding where its weaknesses are and where its strengths are is really important by general like users, right? So for example, if machine learning algorithm, I think there was this case like makes a recommendation that the principal needs to, uh, like is not performing well, then like you have to go back and look and make sure that it's actually correct, not just take it for it's like, you know, that's what the algorithm says, so that's what we're gonna do, <laughs> right? So I, I think that that's a key, like understanding like the weaknesses so we don't just like go into those edge cases, right? I mean, I know we're just scratching the surface here, right? Um, uh, we don't have much time. Uh, I was going to ask what do you think is missing in the conversation, this conversation, but why don't we kind of open it up a little bit to the audience? Because um, they will ask about what's missing in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi. I really appreciate the conversation. Um, my name's Alex Shub. I work with School Empowerment Network. And I'm thinking about uh, Kian, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, when you were talking about your high school experience having two good teachers out of 10, and the notion that that could be somehow captured and replicated en masse, and while I'm sure we could all agree, like on some bell curve, there's some teachers are far better than others, and yet that best teacher experience is a back and forth, I would argue. Right, and that it's not just about an effective presentation, but the teacher also then modulating and responding to the student's excitement, right, and, and creating that sort of live mentor-mentee thing that probably got most of us really moving at some point. So I'm wondering if you think that's something AI can do eventually or soon, is not just get good at diagnosing like what the misconceptions are and giving the right zone of proximal development question, but diagnosing when people are getting excited and matching their mode of thinking so that you get that, that mutual benefit, I guess. Thanks. I can start and if people, thank you for the question. It's really interesting. Um, I think there's two different streams of innovations that are needed. The first one is the world needs a few very good instructors across many topics and then trying to scale these instructors. So that when I'm in high school, I can watch the theory on a high quality video that is made by someone somewhere else in the world and I can get that human touch and connection on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a set of technology and I think we're pretty mature on that front uh, in terms of technology, not in terms of operationalizing it everywhere. Uh, the second thing that I think you're talking about is then uh, what, what is the place of AI in that stream? I think AI can apply to the content delivery um, in both sides of the flipped classroom. Um, uh, when, when it comes to scaling um, um, a teacher, let's say the best teacher in math actually speaks Mandarin, doesn't speak English. Well, AI can actually help translate that and deliver it in a very natural manner to the rest of the world. Everybody can benefit from the best teacher in math who's in China. Um, that's one example. There are many more tactical examples where AI can help that delivery so that it happens at different levels. And then for the facilitator, 
I think the facilitator cannot quite wrap their head around what is these students' skills, what can I help them the most with, what is the pathway that I can show them. AI can bring all that data. Actually, this student is the 73rd percentile if you compare them to the similar stage student in this geography at that level. Here is what we recommend for them, and we need you to motivate them. We need you to push them. And I think that's uh, what it's going to be. And the skills of a facilitator are completely different than the skills of an instructor. It's actually two different skill sets. So when we say, let's train 100,000 teachers, it's really not true. It's we need to train a few to teach very well online, and we need to train a lot to deliver that human experience. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, for further questions, let's just address it at the end. You are more than welcome to come up. Thank you very much for your time.